there. Welcome. Welcome. This is uh, I'm Kim from the Paint Spot, and we are here to learn about uh, fiber and fiber arts. And uh, Judy is here. I'm going to let you take over. Take it over. You're oh, muted, you're... Judy. <laughs> <laughs> I muted myself so that you wouldn't hear any background noise. <laughs> It's a wonderful opportunity. Thanks so much, Kim, for hosting this Zoom. It's a great opportunity for us to get to know our members as well and for the public to be able to become familiar with Fiber Art Network. Um, we are a group of Western Canadian self-defined artists, which um, means fiber in all of its different forms. And each of us practices in our entirely uh, unique way. And yet we have a lot of common threads, if you'll pardon the pun. So tonight we're going to be featuring... Uh, first, your video um, from PBO, who is our product sponsor tonight, and then we'll host um, first Susan Jensen and then Karen Johnson. So take it away, Kim. Oh, you're putting me on the spot right away. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to, I'm on my iPhone here because that's the only way I can do that video. Okay. Let's just switch here quickly. Uh, no, 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 no. It says screen share. Yes. Screen. Yep. Okay. And then we'll do, uh, I saved it somewhere here through all my stuff. Here we go. I'm sorry, Kim. I didn't mean to put you on the spot quite so fast. <laughs> That's okay. I am getting faster at this. Uh, so um, I'm going to just play it and make sure, give me the thumbs up that you can hear the sound. Yep. The textile paints we're using today are manufactured in France by Pebio. They make three different types of paint. Although they all look the same in the little containers, they're very different. They're set of color opaque for dark fabrics. They come in a range of colors plus metallics. They're set of color transparent for light fabrics. Their range of colors includes uh, the fluorescent colors, great for glowing under black light. And then we have the set of silk a very transparent flowing color. What makes these paints different is their consistency and their working properties, their coverage, and how they look and feel once they're done and set on the fabric. Let's see how they really work. Once the paint is dry, it is easier to see the differences. Set a color for dark fabrics is opaque, especially the metallics. You cannot see through them. Set a color for light fabric is transparent. The colors appear most intense and the pattern is visible through the paint. Set a silk is highly transparent. Note how the colors blend along the edges for interesting and unpredictable results. This one is more controllable. And these are the most controlled edges. In fact, they're almost painter. Each paint also feels different. You can really feel set a color opaque on the fabric. It will stiffen light fabric, so it would be better suited for a fabric like cotton and denim. 
Set a color transparent has very little body. It would be ideal for wearable items like quilts and pillows, where you might feel it too much on the opaque fabric. Set a color silk leaves no texture on the fabric. It is ideal for delicate fabrics and scarves. All of these are heat set with an iron. Yeah, there. So uh, that video is uh, like eight years old. I've gotten better since then, but it does show. I'll just stop screen sharing, I guess. Uh, how do I do that? Go and we ahead. have a number of people in the waiting room as well. Okay. I couldn't. Um, actually, I can just end me. Uh, end there. Yay. Yeah, right. um, there we are. I admit I admitted everyone. Good. So okay. Pevio makes a large range of materials. Um, and I also do a lot with the stained glass paints, the glass paints, the porcelain paints. So if you ever really want to get into incorporating glass and and fabric, you could do that with the Pebio products. Um, and I think at the end of the month, we'll be having the Pebio representative come and do uh, everything that she's working on. She's a really amazing mixed media artist. So stay tuned for that information. Yeah. So, hey, that's Pebio. Okay. Are you able to take questions about Pebio products from people that are uh, yes. able to want to? Okay. Yeah. Um, I have one and maybe I'll just lead off, but I'm sure there's other people that do. I uh, purchased from the paint spot. Uh, it was a set of silk medium mm -hmm. and I was using it for painting on silk. And it was the only product that I could find where I could actually control the flow of the set of silk products. Do you still carry that? Is that something that, uh, is it still on the market? I bought it quite a long time ago. Yeah, they have discontinued almost all of their mediums. Um, I can check into that. And sometimes they went through a name change. Oh. So like, okay. I, I know if it's a, a different brand, they call it a no flow. So there might be, a, there might be a name change in that, but I can look that up and get back to you. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So. Oh, wow. That's great. That is silk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that was just my, oh, the other question I had was about shelf life of the product. Um, mm -hmm. If I were to purchase them and, you know, if you keep them on your shelf for too long, they thicken. Um, is there a way to thin them down other than water or is water still the best way to? Water is the best way, but I find Pebio has a very short shelf life compared to a lot of other fabric paints. Um, if you can get some of the textile medium, that is better than just mm -hmm. thinning with water because water would be the solvent in that case. And yeah. that the, th the more water you add to it, the more you're diluting its strength and its ability to adhere to the fabric and certainly its flexibility as well. So um, best to use the medium, but yeah. Um, it's a short shelf life product, which is why they don't make big containers on a lot of stuff. So, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That was all my questions. If anybody oh. else has something. Good questions. I have a question. Um, are all of the paints, can you use them on all of the fabrics? Like set of silk, can you use that on cotton if for some reason you want to and vice versa? I find it's not as good for synthetics. Um, Pebio really likes to stick, stick to natural fibers, um, particularly they have those squeeze outliners I found yeah. on the on the polyesters and, uh, and stuff I usually do for schools. We just buy big vats or bolts of polyester and go to town and it 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 will pop off in the wash. So I, it, it I does like in terms of cotton. 
Yeah, cotton it be it would love cotton and so silks and all so that so stuff. Cotton would be okay. Yeah, yeah. Any okay. any natural fiber has more split ends and ability yes. to hold hold the color. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know. Th I I I knew polyester pro poses a problem, but I didn't realize what it. Well, I guess it's just a plastic, really, isn't it? Yeah, it's day. like acrylics peel off a plastic palette, which yes. is also why I like them for brushes. So if you're painting with any of these acrylic or fabric paints and you're not good at cleaning your brushes, use plastic <laughs> filaments. And huh? if it dries on your um, synthetic haired brush, just soak it in Windex. That's got enough ammonia oh. in it to clean your brushes. Um, if you have any hand sanitizer, alcohol also will break down hardened acrylics and fabric paint. So Mm -hmm. Now you can buy nicer brushes because <laughs> you can save them. Okay. That's a good tip. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. I have to yeah. make notes, Anne. Thanks for asking that because I do have a bad habit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, not me ever. No. <laughs> we, we, we all do. We all do. And uh, yeah, don't throw out anything, any of your brushes that have acrylics in them. So yeah, they're not, they're not yeah. lost. And would that work also for inks on brushes? Uh, yeah, if it's acrylic inks. Yeah. So any of the Talons products or the, um, um, who else does acrylic inks? Any of the Holbein or Golden, all of those, anything that's acrylic based. Other inks, if they're alcohol based, then of course alcohol will take them off. If they're shellac, that's trickier. That's trickier. And mm -hmm. most of our uh, fountain pen inks are naturally water soluble. But if you have any of the documents, the new uh, permanent and light fast inks, then they also have their own solvent and cleaner. Yeah, oh. be kind of match the, the medium up with the, the solvent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yay. Good question. Okay. So <laughs> if we if we don't have further questions, you could, you'll have another opportunity at the end of each speaker or even speak out during the uh, presentations because Karen was noting earlier, it's easier on the PowerPoint if you just jump in so that we don't have to go back and try and find that slide. So just put mm -hmm. your hand up and uh, we'll recognize you and go from there. Um, so our first speaker from FAN is Sue Jensen. And I'll just tell you a little bit about Susan. Um, she says that her creativity runs deep, and from what I know of her, that's very true. She's had many creative hobbies and interests over the years. She learned to quilt in 1990, uh, started designing quilt patterns in 2005, and she says she found her true passion in the fiber art world in 2012. She uses a wide variety of fabrics, fibers, and paints to create landscape pieces that are individual and inspired by the photographs she takes. Mm -hmm. She says her pieces have depth and dimension, which is very true, which draw the viewer in and gives them a feeling they could walk straight into the work. She's an international artist and her works are in private collections all around the world. And she is also a teacher. She's coming to Edmonton for three classes in October, in case any of you are going to be in the neighborhood. Um, she's with Focus on Fiber Art Association, and um, she will if you want to talk at the end of your presentation, you can tell what you're teaching on to. Sure. Sure. Um, she has a professional teaching style that inspires her students to look at nature and the world around them with fresh new perspectives, and then using what they learn to create their own individual masterpieces in fiber. So that is our friend Sue, and you can take it away. You want to share your screen? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I've got to share my screen. Yes, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, I'm going to sh share my PowerPoint with you. Uh, and let's hope I get the right one. And then here we go. Let's see if I can get this. There we go. Okay, so I love experimenting with new mediums. And, and I always like to add color to fabric. You know, I, I bought um, lots, and as you know, working with Northcott for many years, using a lot of commercial fabrics and being part of the Fiber Art Network, you know, I, you when you're working with landscapes, you you can never really quite get the colors that you want. So um, I, I buy um, 
a, a cotton lawn from Trentex. It's uh, it's wonderful. It's the base on which Hoffman fabrics are printed with for all their batiks. So it's a very tight woven um, fabric. So it everything that you put on it, it, it goes on beautifully and smooth. So this little while, I, I'm always researching about what I could use, what, what is the challenge for me next? And I found pan pastels. And they're a chalk, a very fine chalk uh, pastel. And I, because I use mediums and inks and paints and whatever I can get my hands on to, to create, um, I thought I'd go through the, a walk of how I'm using the pan pastels and how I'm experimenting with them. They are, um, they come with tools that you can use. Um, and the pan itself is, is, is on the right hand side. They are very, very just on this little pan and you just have to use a little bit. It's amazing how far it can go using this. And um, I've used different types of brushes on them, but the, the actual soft, um, tools do work the best but you know i'm always pushing the wheel so if i find something else that's that's good it's great so the next one is um this is just some of the colors that i used of the pan pastel and i played it right onto the the lawn and it was the shape of the sponges some other sponges that you get with it but it gave it for me it almost gave it an old world feel and it's because i think of the the um, the masters of, of, you know, back in the day where the colors were very muted and that type of thing and, and dark. So depending on the palette, now Pan Pastel has um, 98 different colors, something like that. But um, I, I just got uh, one specific one, which was called Landscape, because that's my, my, my go-to colors. So I, I wanted to try different types of um, fibers and fabric to see where it works and where it doesn't. And this is unwashed cotton canvas. And um, the left is, is a, um, I've painted with the pan pastel and put a, a fixative spray on. And that's, that's kind of the texture that you get. The middle, I used gel medium, and then there was nothing on the right uh, at all, because I wanted to see what difference. So the gel medium darkened the colors a bit more. So note to self, okay, if I'm working in a landscape and I want to I wanna darken the colors, then okay, I, I know what's going to happen without a big surprise. So there's always something to try. And then, you know, what else do I have in my studio? Well, you know, I found some cotton gauze and uh, I thought, well, this is good. I'll try that. And it gave it, gave it a very, um, I don't know, kind of a fine iridescent, like, I'm not quite sure how you explain it, but it, it's very soft, like, um, and you can see the tree stumps. I've, and I'm gonna just flip my camera if that's possible. Um, maybe not. I will, I'll show you at the end. Let's put it that way, because I've got another camera set up so you can see a little bit better. But I, one of the things that I've always wanted to do is, is uh, create tree stumps that had texture in it. And I was always coming up with ideas and it doesn't work well. The pan pastels give it the color. You can use it on, on, on this technique and, and, um, and it started giving me some other ideas, but this is great. So now I'm thinking of the next problem, next uh, chance or a different type of um, fabric. I've also used it on craft, craft text. Uh, it's a washable, paintable fabric paper that can stitch through it. And again, you can see the difference um, on the left um, without and, and on the right is, again, it's darker using the gel, the gel medium. And I've also used a fusible web. Oh my gosh, it's just crazy. And Lutrador works wonderful on Lutrador. So if you want to cancel it now, it's a dry medium. So it's kind of fun to work with dry medium um, so that I don't have to wait till something dries and then I have to start, you know, that type of thing. So it has that, those um, beautiful properties. I, we got some Zelon from the UK and 
we all didn't know what it was, but we thought we'd try it. And Xenon is like Lutrador, but it's extremely finer in its, you, you get them in different weights and it doesn't burn quite as the same as Lutrador. It doesn't get crusty, a good art term, a crusty piece of fabric, right? So, um, so I thought, okay, let's, let's try it. So I use that um, and it, it, it's amazing. I use it on the gel plate with it as well. And you can see the bottom right corner, it, it kind of spider webbed in a sense. Um, it didn't, it, it kind of lifted off the gel plate and, and I was trying to, you know, smush it down. But when I pulled it off, I just loved the effect. So, you know, you're playing with a, a medium that we're kind of pushing the, the boundaries on which it was made for, which is, you know, but you can also, yes, absolutely, Judy. Oh, I don't have a voice. You're still muted. My apologies. Um, when you're applying it on the gel plate, are you just um, brushing it on? Are you? Yeah, I, I, I literally use, um, I have a, a tool here. This is kind of the soft tool. Um, and I use that right directly on the gel plate. And you can get quite a few prints off a of gel, off of this with the gel plate. And then you clean your gel plate with baby oil. So I, I, I just put it on the gel plate because it's a bit sticky. So you have a nice tool to, to play around with it. But uh, yeah, that's what I use. It's kind of like a sponge, like the tips come off and you can you know put new ones on if you want, but yeah. Um, they get dirty eventually and you just clean them to get to change a color. If you don't want that contaminating the next color, you just use a paper towel and wipe it off the paper towel and then you can go in and get another color, which is really great. Okay. And do the pan pastels actually stick to the non-porous materials? Because these are these are spun bond. They're they're not yeah, I wouldn't they, say they're not they, really fabric, but no, yeah, no, but they stick. Yeah, absolutely. And and um and that was my 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 research is what does it work on? And it does work on all of these. And I've I was been having a blast. And I even took the heat tool to it and and burned in, in it to see um, how it would react. And it seems to work react really well. So it it, it it's quite interesting uh, how to, to play around with this type of a product. Um, so just keep that in mind as you're, you know, try it. I the all I can say is that if you have something that I haven't mentioned, um, and I'm sure you do because I can't use all the products, but there's something in there, then then give it a try and see how you feel it works for you. The nicest part about, especially on the gel plate, is that we always have to wait into, into you know, do it on the gel plate. We gotta wait that layer dries, da 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 da. Here, I don't have to do that. It's dry then I can I can roll over my gel medium or my paint or whatever you want and then you know rub it down and then pull it off and it it works it's it's working it's just great it's so you know keep that in mind as we go along and I'm I, I this is on um again on cotton and um I even stitched by machine and and by hand, I use molding plays. Now you can see the top right corner, that's my son, because I didn't have a son in the molding plate as I, I, I did a snowflake. So just, that's a cold sun, just keep that in mind, right? <laughs> keep you, keep you chilling, you know? But again, it, 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 it works well and I can hand stitch through the fabrics, that type of thing. Now it does come off. And one of the things that I've been using is, um, I started off with my research. They said you could put, um, um, yes, you can. It's uh, alcohol, rubbing alcohol on it. And it did, it did, but it dried. And, and I'll, I'll explain when I did my Edmonton piece, um, I did it. And then I did more research and now I'm mixing a 50-50 with the GAC 900 and it seals it. So. It works perfectly. I put it in a fine mist bottle and and uh, and seal it that way. I use paper. Like I even tried went out for lunch and and uh, one of our five members said, "Here, Sue, to try it on this towelette." So th this is a little towelette from the restaurant, you know, to wipe your hands on. So I opened it up and 
I started playing with that with the pan pastels and it works on that. Um, the other one is is brown paper. I have it on a roll. And the interesting part was it actually it actually enhanced the the actual grain of the paper from the tree actually came out. It was just amazing um, to see what was happening. So you know you can constantly play with different um, substrates and see how it works. Tissue paper on the gel plate, this is just a sample of playing around with the di tissue paper on the cell, the, the uh, plate. It, it, um, it, it really, it gives you a soft look depending on how much you put on. Again, I can get quite a few pulls off of this and um, some pulls work better than other. I find using a gel medium really works well. And if I'm working on a landscape that has water, so I can paint the water. And then after i am got all my pieces together, then I, I want to get water to look wet. Sounds crazy. But I used a clear gel. I used, I was using caustic wax on the piece, but it's hard for people to have all of those things that, you know, as part of their toolkit, because you got to have the heating system and maxing. And so the, the Golden's gel worked fabulously. And I and I really enjoy doing that. Now the, the fabric is, or the water is shiny. So it looks like the sun's glaring off the water and it looks wet. So I was really pleased with that. And again, the pen pastels work great with, with the Golden. Um, and it's part of the Golden um, brand now is the pan pastels. Um, sealing again, I was saying with 50 50% 50 uh, water, this is um, this is my piece for uh, doorways and gateways, whatever it was. And, and uh, I'm more landscape person. So this has been um, designed with the pan pastels and stitching. And then I made my tree trunk as I saw it before. And then there's some uh, again, some uh, hand stitching. I did some uh, wool fibers and, and needle felted down, down here, and then some embroidery and, you know, threw everything at it type of thing. So, um, and then I thought, okay, I want to seal the pan pastels because I, I don't know where these pieces are going to, how often they're going to be handled. Um, so I did the spray with the, um, the, Nine, GAC 900 mixture and it, it, it works like a dream. Thanks to to you, Judy, for letting me know mixing it with the, you know, because um, I know they don't like you to mix it too hard. It's usually like 20, 20, 80 type of thing, but I wanted just a, I didn't, I wanted a very light spray um, and I'll show you the little bottle now. It was my water bottle for my watercolors, but now it's a bottle with the, the, the GAC in. So, Two. But the yeah. texture, it, the texture on the tree trunk, is that real te texture or is it just paint of like that? No, well, again, oh. this is where I, when I showed you my tree trunk earlier using the, um, the cotton gauze and the pan pastels and the gel medium, mixing those three together, I get this wonderful tree-like texture. And I was so excited because my students were always asking me, well, how do you get a really good textured tree? And now I'm like, oh, I can't wait to share this with my students. Look what we can do now. And, and, <laughs> um, and it, it, it really looks like bark. I mean, I, I was just, just ecstatic that I, come up with something that I now can share with my students and the beauty of, of you know, getting that dimensional feel with the tree and the bark and, you know, um, so depending on how you paint it with the pan pastels, you know, you, you could do, I mean, birch bark, you can do red cedars, you could, it, it the, the trunks are, you know, um, sky's the limit to, to doing that Karen so yeah and the pan pastels because of the depth of the pigment it's pure pigment okay there's no fillers or binders in it so because now I'm applying pure pigment I'm really getting the depth of color that I really like and they they lay nicely on top you can blend with them it, it's 
it's a real fun thing to do. And it's, like I say, it's a dry medium. So I'm not, oh my God, I got with that to dry. So I have to figure out how I'm going to cover it up. You can cover up, you can blend, you can do whatever. Um, so it has some really interesting properties with it. And like I say, with the tissue paper, um, like I'm trying everything I can throw at it. And um, so far, so good. And, uh, and it's fun. You can use it through stencils on your gel plate if you're doing stencils or mark making. It's, it's again, another um, avenue that we can, you know, explore some more on it. And, um, and this is how I travel with them. They come in, you can screw them together. Um, so they're just the pan pastels and you can take as many as you wanted to chew, whatever. Um, and you can just hold them one at a time as you're doing it. So if you're out, you know, with a sketchbook or whatever, and you want to add color or that type of thing, you can do that. Um, but they're, they're, you know, extremely easy to blend with. Um, that was the other thing that I liked about it. There's no spillage. You don't need water. You know, you know, when you're out, you know, sketching or that type of thing, it's an easy way to, to, uh, yeah, and they, they do. They have 92 highly pigmented colors, 20 pure colors, 20 tints, 20 shades, extra darks, metallics, pearlescence. So, I mean, it, the gambit is there. Um, but I, I'm, like I say, I'm a pretty simple girl and I, and I just work with my landscape colors the most and, um, and just play around with them as I go. So, um, you know, and with my gel mediums, you know, when I did this piece, the the water made my waves and, and um, gave me more texture to my pieces uh, with my three-dimensional boat uh, as well. So, you know, like molding paste and, and you can you can add any of that to our fibers and it really adds dimension to your pieces um, as you go along. And then, uh, and I want to say thank you. Um, give it a try. It, it's it's amazing what you can do with a lot of this new technology that we have and new uh, products that are out there. It's good to test. And even if you get a group together and decide, hey, let's all try one. And then, you, you know, um, it's great for experimentation and, and it's a lot of fun to play around with them. So, so I'm going to stop sharing this. And I'm going to go over to my camera and hopefully it's going to, which camera I've got, I got so many of them. that, that, Ooh, that just works. before you do that. Yeah. Questions. Uh, Barbara has a question for you. Sure. You have the landscape set. I think you said. Of the yes, I do. Else. How many are in that? Seven. Okay. Yeah. Have you seven. found that that's a really good start and is doing what you want or have you acquired more <laughs> um well I've, i have acquired a few more uh thanks to <laughs> thanks to golden but i um they, they come in different sets so depending on your your colors like if you work with bright colors then you can get a kit that does bright colors you know that type of thing you can pick and choose and make your own pa pastel set as well but um the kits were good I, I looked they said oh landscape perfect uh, I'll take the landscape and see what that does and um you know if you if you you can add white including in that is white so you can you can lighten the your colors by pre-mixing them on a piece of paper this is the, the the wonderful part of it um if you were doing it on water on paper if you were using pan pastels on paper and if you make a mistake you just use a white eraser and you can erase what you did completely and yeah. then then go back in and fix it so there's there's that that part of it 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 kind of works on fabric depending on the fabric you don't get it completely out with an eraser but you can lighten some things with one of the white um, erasers but you know you just uh, to me I just add more it's kind of like it's it's an easy applique because you don't have to turn the edges you just you know pan pastel over it that type that type of thing so <laughs> 
there's a lot of forgiveness with the pan pastels that I really like. But at the end of your piece, when you're finished, I would suggest you spray it with that mixture of uh, um, GAC 900 and, you know, GAC 900, the reason I use GAC 900, one, I have the bottle, and two, it's, it's, um, it's liquidy. Where textile medium, it's a little bit thicker, so I prefer to use the 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 GAC 900. Mm -hmm. Thank so you. Is that a question for Kim about that then. Um, Kim, do you have pan pastels in the store? And are they special order for the kits or do you have them? We we do have them. We stock just a few. Um, and if you go to our website, you can just look in the search. You type pan pastel. And I think we have a portrait set, a basic set usually tens and fives. Um, yeah, we can special order whatever you want, but we try to keep some basic sets in stock. Yeah. We're, yeah. we're a little bit spoilt here because we have Schmenke pastels and they are so super soft. So we stock the applicators because it works the same, whether it's a pan pastel or a Schmenke pastel. Schmenke is unusual yeah. in how soft it is. So everything yeah. and no fillers and all that stuff so um the pan pastel though is very big so i think you're looking at i don't know eight to eight to ten dollars per color um, yeah but you, so, you get a you get a lot of color in there yes and I, i'll pull one out so you can kind of see what color would you like to see <laughs> I'll, I'll fill out a, a blue but I'll, and I'll, I'll put it on my um Let's see if I can get my camera, which camera I've got it. Is it the next? Uh, we have, Look we have, at this. We have a blank. Uh, I might have to see if I can. We have we have a question, too, from someone saying, who makes pan pastels? Oh, Golden. Yeah. Well, actually, what happens, pan, Golden bought um, pan pastels, and they're now part of the Golden line. Okay, so... Um, yeah, absolutely. So even though if you go to the Golden website, Pan Pastels are, you know, you just type in Pan Pastels and it's one word and um, they'll have everything that you need there um, as well. So um, okay. hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. And I, I'm not sure if that's the right one or not. <laughs> See, I knew there was, I have all these questions. So this is the pan pastel here, as you can see. And it's um it, it it's very thin, but it, it's just loaded with, with pigment. And when I was talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, here's here's my tree stump. And I used um a fine gauze-like material, cotton, doesn't matter what it is really. And I took the, um, I used matte medium and I just put it on. Now, I first of all put it on a flat piece of fiberglass and thought, oh, this is good. You know, it'll dry in the fiberglass. It's doing nothing. Yeah, well, it's stuck to the fiberglass. It took me a while to get it off. So note to self, right? Um, freezer paper, uh, something that you can pull off the back, not, not have a, you know, something stiff for your, you know. I mean, it came off. It came off. But there's the back of it. I don't know because you can see you can see how flat it is here, uh, but now you can see the texture on the tr on on the actual piece. And you know I can go back in there and like I tore the edges so I can get more of a root on the bottom, and um, then I just went and added extra darkness. If I found oh gee I missed a speed I can I can add more. So I used you know, the, the red <clears throat> and the, the black and, and burgundy and, and whatever color I have. It, this is, um, I'll tell you, I think this is burnt sienna. Uh, this is, uh, yes, it is. And so I, I, I wanted to just start adding that color and, and blending and, and smoothing things out. So what's really excited about this, this is where, you know, um, incubating time, as we learned today. 
now I'm looking at this now and I will be able to do a 3D piece from this. So I will roll it up and give and make a 3D stump. And then I can then, one of the things that fascinates me in nature is I'll see an old stump and there's a new little tree growing out of it. And I've always wanted to create one of those. And so this, now um, someone's gonna say to me, well, you know, how do, cause that was one of the things I was saying, how am I going to work this? And I thought, well, wait a minute, this has got possibilities now. And so, and I can make tree branches, you know, just out of the same fiber and make it, let it, let it dry and stiff. Again, I use freezer paper wax side up that helps. I can just make tree, um, actual tree, uh, you know, actual tree, trunks and then I can start adding threads and that type of thing and there'll be more 3D in, in my work so I can you know really bring the the forest out of the picture if um, as I go along and it, it can be whatever forest you want so and rocks you know that's the other thing that people are looking at you know how do I get rocks and I've tried a lot of different ways and I thought wait a minute this could be you know I could get stoned on this, no matter. I just rocks that type of thing. So, you know, it's giving me the texture I'm looking for to give me the depth that I that I that I want in my work. So, so hopefully that helps, and uh, and I'll stop sharing, and we'll just go back to. There you go. So, if you have any other questions, please. Thank you, Terry. <laughs> We do have another question from Darlene. Sure. Uh, what are the differences between pan pastels and chalk pastels? Oh, well, pan pastels is a chalk, okay? The uh, The nicest part about the pans is it's easier to, to get a smooth, for the, for me anyway, it's, it's, I can swipe up and take as much as I want. I'm not working from a stick. I don't know the the one that you're talking about, Kim. Is it stick form that it comes in or? Yeah, so it is, uh, pan pastel is a soft pastel. Yes. So not a chalk. Chalks are usually have a lot of filler and they're dusty. And pan pastel is just really nice. Like you're using these almost like makeup applicators to lift yes. it off and place it. So it's got a very, we're all comfortable using like blushes and eyeshadow uh yeah, sponges so it's really nice so even in your tree where you want to just dust over some of the real texture on the tippy tops yes. you could do that really nicely so yes. it is a a stick of quality pastel but in a flat form so yes. not crumbly not something you have to draw with it's just like place it place it blend it yeah 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 thank you kim that's a great description um, I get so excited about the fact that I could do this <laughs> and playing yeah. with the pan pastels because it's given me that other option. I mean, I've used watercolor. I use, I use, you know, um, the same thing. We're, we're acrylics, that type of thing. But having a dry medium, um, it, it, it's exciting that I, I can, I can play with it and not have waiting time in between or bleeding it out because it, you know, it, it, wherever you put it it stays it's you're not getting that type of thing and don't get me wrong I love all of these and I use them for all different reasons but this is new to me and and the experimenting has been fun thanks to my my group because they were pulling stuff out. hey Sue how about this how about this and and if you have anything and and you try on it let, let me know because the more I know the better better I can share that information with so um, I hope you found that interesting. Oh, yes, my, oh, I better, sh I didn't show you this, so I better show, because I promised I'd show you this now that I know which camera I'm on. This is my little spray bottle that I mix the 50-50 in, and it's got, you know, dirt from my hands because I've been playing with the pan pastels in this, but um, it's just a fine mist. You don't want anything that that you know you squirt it and it's like the stream comes out and you just shot your picture and and you've got it on there a fine mist is the best thing that you can do and again so this is kind of the tool um, here 
um, they come in different shapes, square, uh, a pointed one, so you can get into really small areas if you want to, a kind of an ovally shape and um, a kind of a real rounded shape. So I use these because it's just, they're easier to use, but I have used blender brushes and paint brushes, but it doesn't quite get the, um, the pan pastel out. You, you, you waste more pan pastel with those because it, it just kind of goes everywhere. So this is more concentrated. So um, yeah, so there you go. Okay, well, thank you very much, Sue. That was a wonderful presentation and very informative. And um, there's a comment from Bernadette, who is the coordinator for uh, with Pat Moore for Doors and Gateways. Yes. And saying that your piece is fantastic. But I'm going to do a plug now for the conference, for the Fiber Art Network conference coming up September 19th to the 22nd. And the Doors and Gateways exhibition is going to premiere there. So you'll all be able to see Sue's piece firsthand at the conference. So pretty excited about going. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Judy. No problem. See you soon. Okay. Okay. And Karen, um, Karen Johnson is our next speaker. And I'll just tell you a little bit about her. Karen, I lifted your bio from the Fiber Art Network website. Um, Karen's been creating with fiber and fabric. It's been an integral part of her journey through her life. She participated in 4-H Clothing Club. That's a hard one to say. And she has a home economics degree. She was a teacher and has lots of experimentation. And all of those things together have shaped her approach to her art. Um, her inspiration comes from daily walks in her home in Langley, B.C., from her photography, from her travels, from her Scandinavian background, and from growing up on the prairies. Her work has been accepted into national and international exhibitions and has won awards at both levels. Her membership and participation in national and international fiber-related groups has supported and strengthened her journey. Um, Karen's been a very active member of Fiber Art Network for several years. Um, she's a member of Sakwa Studio Art Quilt Associates, uh, the Langley Quilters Guild, and the Langley Arts Council in British Columbia. So welcome, Karen, and your presentation is on using paper in fiber. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Oops. I want to say thanks to some of the fan members who have seen some of this pre presentation before and um, hope that I'm giving you some new ideas and different ones. Um, I put this together a little while ago and now kind of moving into a different direction with my paper and so on. Uh, I, I, I was trying to remember when I got excited about paper. And I think it was when I went to a Sandra Meach workshop and part of it was, oh, we're gonna get to use paper. And so this is my first piece creating with paper. And it's just this piece of paper here up in the corner, whatnot. And it, you can't tell if it's fabric or paper, but that's part of it. And um, the only thing you have to think about when you're working with paper, it, you don't really want to stitch rip unless you want that holy look to it. Um, a friend that had, we were in a little group together one evening, we had to sit down and create something out of paper. And so this is what I ended up with. And some paper um, is very fragile or uh, is easily ripped or so on. So these strips of fabric are paper here. What I did is I interfaced them. So with the fusible interfacing that you would use in clothing. And so it changes the texture of them, makes them much more malleable to use. Um, 
and this is, I don't think I even bothered to uh, fuse this one. This is a heavyweight um, handmade paper here and then some silk fusion and so on. So this was fun to do. I was inspired by tile work in Oaxaca that was hung together. And so it made a wall hang. And I did a, a previous piece. And when I was working on my first piece, I was thinking, oh, I finally know what I can do with this, all this paper I bought in Oaxaca. So what I did is, is I, um, I didn't rip the paper. Um, because paper uh, rips differently in each direction. It's like fabric. There's a warp and a weft to it off. And so uh, I didn't want to cut it because that would give too straight a line. So all I did is I used my ruler and then ripped it. And so it gets the jagged edge. And then to get the grid format, which is what I was working at, is I stitched all of these to a tool background. Uh, it worked, but sometimes the tool, the two pieces were too close together. So I just cut them apart. And when I secured the paper part to the background, the quilted background, I just used a zigzag with an invisible thread. And so whatever I slashed, cut. And then some places the pieces were too far apart. So I just put a little fold in it. It, it, it was tricky but it was fun to be able to use this paper that I got from uh, Oaxaca. There's a detail of it. So uh, it, it, I can't remember if I, I think, yeah, I stamped them all first. So I just played with them and did lots of different stamping and then um, quilted. And the quilting was kind of fiddly too, going from one square to the next. I had these three pieces up on my design wall because I was thinking, I have to do something with these pieces and what am I going to do with them? And then I thought, oh, I love all three together because they were, I had was thinking of doing each of them separately. So this is just to some canvas that I uh, played with, splashed some color on it and, and did some stamping and whatnot. And I, um, mounted it on, I think that stuff that you use for bags or hats, I forget what it's called. And that, and then the edging on all three pieces is hand dyed linen, which really sets it off. Here's one of my first paper pieces I did, uh, black and white, and I, and I love doing the black and white pieces. And this is a commercial piece of that, and they all went together. Caltex, there's the name of what I mounted it on. Uh, one um, fun kind of paper to do is to make something called momogami. It's a Japanese term meaning kneaded paper. So you can see right there, I just have a paper bag and you can use any kind of oil, olive oil, canola oil, corn oil, whatnot. And when you're working it, um, it's better to veer on the light side of using the oil rather than too much because um, mm. it just would get too gooey and, and oily. You can also use glycerin or an acrylic medium, but I've never tried. I've only done the uh, one with oil. And I, I think one time I did a presentation, I had people do this. So there's paper bags. And it, they kind of look like leather or they get a real nice texture to them. So after I do the PowerPoint, I have the samples so you can see them live. And uh, they, they add so much texture to paint your, your artwork. So here's some momogami that, that I used. Uh, this is my first time using the momogami paper in a fiber art piece and just, um, I didn't glue the whole thing because I like the ragged edge here and having it loose, but the square inside of that momogami piece was fused on and then played with some leaf pieces there. Uh, when I've been working 
with uh, making fabric paper, paper fabric. Uh, I tested some different mediums to use, and I also used these when I was doing silk fusion. The product I like the best is Golden Fabric Painting Medium, GAC 900, a golden acrylic compound. I think it's soft, it's soft and flexible, uh, a little bit of a glossy finish, and you can iron it. GAC 900 is a medium to add to your acrylic paints to make them, to make it not hard when you paint it on fabric. So uh, because of that, and because you can heat set it, you can also iron your fabric paper when you do it. You can use a, a golden gel medium, any kind. I find it gave a much stiffer feel to the paper, fabric paper I made. Uh, it had, this is matte, so it gave a matte finish. I had some archival glue, so I tried it. It was a very, very stiff. And um, as I did at the bottom here, I did all of these at full strength so I can experiment. So you could see about diluting it. There's a Joe Sonia textile medium, which is the same thing as the GAC 900. It's used to add to an acrylic paint so that when you paint it onto fabric, it's not stiff, but it is so shiny. Uh, I didn't like it all. Here's the Joe Sonia one. And really, you see the shine more than whatever you're trying to create. For base fabrics, when I'm, I'm writing this presentation, most of it is about making fabric paper into fabric. So you've got fabric that you can use. And so I you, I like using the turban cloth. You can get that at East Indian fabric stores. Um, you don't, the uh, because it's so lightly woven, it doesn't soak up the glue or the GAC 900 as much, whereas a regular broadcloth would soak it, soak it up more. But if you're using a lot of heavyweight fabrics, to collage with, uh, you're going to need to use more glue because of the stiffness, because it, it soaks up the glue. And then this idea I have, oh, it'd be kind of cool to do uh, a printed background and with transparent papers, but I haven't done it yet. Or you could use a yellow background and uh, with tra transparent papers and see what comes out with that. So here's, um, I didn't have a lot of red fabrics, so I painted a whole bunch of uh, pieces so I could have more variety when I was doing my red collage. And there's a whole mixture here. Here's some of that uh, fabric that you get when you get a bouquet of flowers. This is a paper towel from dyeing and mopping up stuff, or you, you might have a paper towel that you put your paintbrush on or whatever. So all different kinds of paper here. Here's some, uh, some more selection. This is from wrapping up uh, flowers. Here's some uh, from dyeing fabric and I'm just putting some dye on to the paper towels. So a whole uh, origami paper, you can get use handmade paper. Here I painted some more to get some more texture. This little one down at the bottom, coffee filters are really fun to paint. Uh, you get nice texture with them. If you, uh, art supply stores have tissue paper that bleeds. So like when you're wrapping a present to give to somebody, you don't wanna use your bleeding tissue paper in case they got wet hands. You're gonna get the dye all over the hands and so on. But the tissue paper that bleeds really gives it a nice look because you're kind of melding all the pieces together. So you can see the wonderful bleeding here and so on. And I've done pieces that are just with the bleeding tissue paper, or you can just throw in some um, bleeding tissue paper in with other pieces. Another thing that you can add to your piece that you've done is, well, I've got cheesecloth here. 
but you can take some yarns and, and use the GAC 900 or any other kind of glue it and glue it all on to for some more texture in your pieces. When I start working, I always start with three and I start with the thickest papers. You don't want to put your transparent papers on the bottom because they're going to get covered up. What you want to do is put the transparent on top of the heavier weights so you can see through to the heavier weight of papers. And, and I just, it's so much fun to rip them and why not? And some people, I don't know, like you get this nice white going. You don't want to cut that off because when you see the pieces, you'll see that little flash of white makes it look much, much better. The heavier papers, I put, you can see I put some, a squirt of adhesive on the fabric where it's going. And then I also brush it on the back of the paper uh, because it it's gonna soak into the fabric and you want it to soak into the paper so it adheres together well. But when I do things like paper towels or napkins or tissue, I often just put it down over top and then uh, brush the GAC 900 over top because it soaks through so quickly. Now with paper towels, uh, you need, if they're double ply or triple ply, you want to separate the plies uh, because when you separate them, you've got three layers of color. So the top layer will be the brightest or darkest and the bottom layer will be lighter. And you can sort of get a shadow effect or all sorts of things with it. Same as napkins. Napkins, you have to be very careful. Just lots of napkins are just two layers. So you, uh, and some are three. And it takes a little bit of work to get them apart. But some napkins, the commercial ones, the, the color will go through. Or uh, sometimes there's no color. It's just white. Or sometimes it's sort of like, like a shadow that happens. Erin, can I just yeah. ask a question? Um, in the previous slide to this one, you were showing that you had not done any stretching um, or, you know, pulling of the substrate. And are you finding you have to frame it at all? No, no. I just, yeah, no, I don't. I just lay it down and that's it. Fantastic. Yeah, no, no, I haven't had any problem with it. So here I keep gluing in odd numbers because it, it's just not as, uh, it's more exciting than uh, even numbers. And then at some point I just forget about the uh, working in threes and I just start filling up spaces and whatnot. And um, most of these, all these pieces I've done were monochromatic, but I found it was a really good exercise in making sure you've got all a whole bunch of different values and put how different pieces work beside other pieces and so on. And and it, at, at this stage here is about when I would start using the transparent papers and putting over top. Now this I stand doing this so it, it you can get tired. It you know it takes a good half hour or more of standing and ripping and whatnot. So um it, I, it just catch up to me. So here's my finished yellow paper fabric. And at the time I was into, well, our, our group in the lower mainland did a, um, a exhibit on the golden mean, but I had been working with it anyway. So I did this sunflower and I, these lines are not stitching lines. They're lines with a pigma pen. And so it's based on the Fibonacci sequence, the curves in it. And the first I had I marked every little spot. So I measured the circumference and uh, I needed 34 spaces and I stuck in 34 pins. And when I got all the way around, it was perfect. I couldn't believe it. But when I did the other direction, I had to uh, mark 55 spaces several times so it took me a while to do it and then when I was doing it I oh 
I should do the uh, petals in the Fibonacci sequence. So there's 34 yellow petals and 13 green. And uh, friends have been using wire form for sculpture and I got scraps from them. I think <laughs> my next, yeah. So I've got scraps of, there's a strip of wire mesh down each of these. So you can see how I can shape the uh, fabric petals. And there's two different kinds of wire mesh you can get. You can get it online. I just got it from friends and I can show you after the PowerPoint what it looks like, but it's it, do sculpture like a paper mache sculpture or whatnot. You could get a base started with this mesh and then go work on top of it. And here's uh, a round one that I did. And I after I finished with doing all the paper, I couched different fabrics and fibers and all sorts of stuff on my blue moon. And there's a close up of some of the stitching that I did on it. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't stitch rip. <laughs> you, you don't really notice you make a mistake on something like this, so you don't need to worry about it. But when I do do my quilting on, if there's like this corner right here, you can see how I've stitched through it to make sure that it doesn't pop up and come undone or something like that. Here is uh, my purple piece and I really like the, the jagged edge here. And I wanted to, because there was no background on half, half the size of it, half of it. What I did is I laid fusible interfaces, quite a heavy weight. And okay. I had a strip of it that I put underneath here. And then what I did is I, with the fusible up, I traced it with a pencil and then cut it out and then fused it to the background. So you can see here where the fusible interfacing is. And I put it all the way around. So even if you're not doing a paper piece or you have a, um, a very lightweight fabric and you want a ragged edge, but you need some sort of support, you can put the uh, interfacing around the edges. And I, I don't use uh, wool batting when I'm quilting. Uh, the paper, it, it's not like cloth because it, you won't get that same texture. But when you do quilt it, you get that the lines the, uh, as another layer. So you get the lines, but not the... Uh, so really boring. You appreciate good speakers when you get them. Like last night's speaker was excellent. This lady's. And here's my red piece. You saw all the red fabrics for uh, our papers before. And uh, if all these pieces, all these pieces that have the white on it, to me, it brings it alive. If it was just solid red with nothing like that, it'd be different. And this, this one has the jagged edge again. And even though it has a background support, I did put the fusible interfacing in the back of it. Here, here's one of my um, yellow green pieces and I've added some um, cheesecloth that I've dyed. And I have a phone, uh, phone box here and here's this. The one thing I did when I was working with all these different papers and different colors is I tried different ways of mounting them. So every single one has a different uh, way of the way it looks. And there's a close up. And I here's how you can see I stitched the cheese. I glued this cheese cloth, but I still stitched it down. And so I just make sure I get the edges of the things tacked down just to keep it um, here. here. Here's my green paper. And here you can see this is some, um, oh, this is one of my coffee filters that I painted somewhere on the lines or whatever. And um, here's some of the um, 
bleeding tissue paper too. You can see it bleeding into the edges a bit. So it just gives it, uh, blends the colors together nicely. Erin, would you be able to hand stitch through these or would it be strictly- Oh yeah, I'm gonna show, after I'll show, I'll show you some samples. You can hand stitch through them easily. They are, it's a, and same as needling. The only time I found a problem with needling with quilting it is if I have really thick handmade paper, you know, like some of this stuff. So what I do is I use both hands. You can't see, I'm doing, I'm showing you without you being able to see. <laughs> I put both hands beside the needle to keep the uh, paper down. Cause when the needle goes through the paper, it might pull it back up. So I just have, and so I use both hands to guide it and get it through the thicker paper. Oh yeah, my, my moment gammy too. I, I, the phone book is wonderful. It, the one thing I did though, I don't know if it's in this piece or another one. My, I have the page with my phone, uh, my numbers, but I, my name is there and part of my phone number, but. I just thought when I'm using the phone book, I don't want people's information on my quilt. So I ripped it. So either their name is there or partial name or their number or whatever. But I, I really like the look that uh, the text brings into it. And um, I don't know, I think this brown one is one of my favorites of the ones I've made. And here's another, the, here's a, this is a, some more fabric paper that I dyed. You just put some dye on it when I was dying. And uh, it's not my wipe up cloths. I make my own, make pseudo wipe up cloths. Um, the black and white. Oh, and friends of mine were in Iceland and brought me back a napkin from Akareri from the fish and chip shop. So that was kind of cool. And one thing I'm doing now is when I recycle my tin cans or glass jars or whatever, I've been saving all the labels. So I haven't used any of them in any of my pieces, but there's so many cool labels out there from your groceries that'll be, I'm looking forward to using them. This piece is all napkins. And so you get a lot of transparency in. And this is from um, a fan uh, prop, a thing. Yeah, and uh, you have to make sure you separate the layers, otherwise um, they won't adhere as well. So I've kind of got to the group in the lower mainland, not kind, but totally got a lot of people in the group in the lower mainland hooked on uh, using paper to make fabric. And so our, at our Christmas get together, we had a napkin exchange. So everybody was supposed to bring like 25 napkins. So there's enough for everybody, but some people bought like four and five packages. And we all went around and picked up the uh, napkins that we wanted. And then people made a, a paper fabric piece. And so th this is the one I made uh, after I collected uh, napkins from some people and, it, and like when I go to somebody's place and, and they have a gorgeous napkin I try not to get my mouth dirty you know I just slip the napkin in my pocket or something and so and good friends I ask them can I have this napkin so, so this is a I had this was a leftover piece from my uh, grand national entry last time and so I had this and I thought, oh, this will make a nice uh, background for it. So, um, oh, here's my phone one. And this is, um, it, I don't know, the black and white is a lot of fun to work with. Yeah. And this piece is one of my first ones that I used where, with the um, black and white, uh, with the napkins and paper and so on. All of these are bits of paper or, or painting on canvas and so on. And it, I, it, I've sold it, which is exciting. And I won an award at, um, well, it used to be the LaConnor exhibit yeah. but at Pacific Northwest. So I won an award for it. So that was cool. 
And that's my presentation. If I'll stop sharing. And are you able to uh, spotlight me? Because I have some stuff I can show. And it would be nice to be in the full screen. You are in full screen on my screen. Oh, you are? I'm yeah. not on mine. So that's why. So uh, I, I'm trying to integrate my paper in with my regular quilting and so on. And so I've been working with uh, napkins. And I was testing this napkin with the GAC 900, but because I'm only doing one piece, the GAC spread around this, the piece. This one I didn't like, but I had another one where it spread and it was kind of a halo around it. And I really liked it, but I couldn't find my sample that I had done. So if you're going to just add paper to what as a feature on your piece and not as a whole collage, you have to keep that in mind. And then I, I practiced, I checked out uh, fusing it onto organza. So that worked very nicely. Here's my momogami. You can see how supple it is. And it's just beautiful to uh, play with and work with. Then I've had this for quite a while. If you feel like you got way too much oil into your piece, just put um, paper towels underneath and on top and, and give it a good press. Or you could just put some books on top for a while. And if... Uh, Karen, oh, just, just to interrupt you there about the momogami, um, you had mentioned putting oil on top of it. Did you color the paper first before you put the oil on, or can no. you color it after it, because no, it's I got oil? This is a black paper. You okay. know how you get a shopping bag and it's black? Yeah. If you could get green a green shopping bag, you could get the same effect. So um, I don't... I don't, I don't have a sample right now. Well, there's the backup, which would be brown. No, I just use it like it is. Okay. Yeah. And, and I haven't had problems with the color coming off onto my hands at all. Okay. And it, it takes about 10 minutes and you can sit there and, yeah. and, and then if you need a little bit more oil, put it on and so on. Yeah. Okay. Karen? Uh, in yeah. the comments, sorry, someone else is speaking. In the comments, there's one from Darlene who said she colored it after. Um, Darlene, do you wanna just speak to that? Okay, sorry, I am still here. Um, it's just, I was using brown paper bags and we were making journal covers with it. So afterwards we wanted to have color. Um, that's like 10 years ago. So we were using Shiva paint sticks a lot and we'd rub the Shiva paint sticks on top of it after it was texturized. And that way the highs, the lows, the ridges, the grooves, they'd all be picked up by the color. And it had a very leathery look, especially if you started with brown paper bags. It was amazing. And then and, was and that's that's good too because the Shiva paint sticks are oil based, and so you wouldn't have problem. Because I don't know, like there's oil in here. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it would be to paint afterwards. But yeah, I'm not sure about that because we were using glycerin as well, and so the glycerin would pretty well work its way through out into your hands. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Kim, do you have uh, any comment about whether you'd use acrylic or you'd have to use some other special paint over top of an oil? Yeah, oil will repel most things uh, it, that are water-based. Oil and water don't go together. Um, but I bet you pan pastel would be nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just I, I, can, I just, can I just say something to you? Um, I was painting on a piece of... Um, uh, computer paper like your printer paper if you can see it and I thought hey I wonder if I could do momogami on it and so I did <laughs> so that's my momogami yeah oh so awesome. I was really excited and I and I was when you were talking about that I thought, oh I forgot that I you know yeah <laughs> so I pulled my sample out for you but it, and it works and it, it is it's just so wonderful um, but I did overdo it with the oil and it, um, yes, it, between two pieces of, it does it's, help because you get kind of carried away. You just, you maybe know. if you have, if the, if you put too much oil on a piece, you could maybe take another piece and kind of squish them together. So yeah. it, you transfer yeah. the oil 
because it, 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 it could, it's better to go on the light side as you start out. Exactly. So if you don't want to work, use this idea in fabric or textile. I just made a bunch of cards that have uh, things attached. Here is a piece of fa paper fabric and you can see how supple it is. And this is, a, it's not all tissue paper. So it's a mixture. So it, uh, it's very nice to work with. And then here's, oh, there's another piece. So this is the pa paper fabric when it's finished. And I would have had a quilted piece here somewhere. Oh, here's, yeah, no, I can't find my quilted piece. Uh, if you were interested in the, in the mesh that I used on the sunflower petals, there's the two different kinds of mesh. It's just when you cut it, you want uh, scissors from the tool shed. It, it's kind of jagged, so it's hard to get in when you're um, sticking it into the petal. And so I just put a chopstick in to spread it apart a bit. And here's my package of labels that I'm saving for. I got some hot sauce here and some Dijon mustard and who knows. So at some point I'll have to show you all what I do with my um, pieces. Oh, here. And here's a piece, of, this is, piece that I've quilted, but I used felt as a background and um, lots of quilting on the back of it. So it's it's almost like real fabric, but you can't, I don't know that you can't wash it. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. it was just yeah. day. So, so I, I have one question and it's something that I struggle with as somebody in an art material store that wants to give everybody, please experiment, do everything, it's all fun. But then the question about longevity comes in and, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're dealing with things like papers that are printed with inks that might fade or oils, like any cooking oil that you use will darken and discolor over time. Um, it will also rot the paper over time. I mean, this is something we lecture oil painters about and, and you want to make sure that you're sealing your, your canvases with PVA glue and then putting the gesso on. So, I don't want to curtail anything, but I'm also like, you know, it's fabric, so it is going to fade anyway. So what mm -hmm. are the what are the concerns and the tolerances within the Fiber Arts Network for what's archival and what's what isn't? I think I think it very I think it's a whole gamut. I, I know most people uh, uh, you don't hang something where the sun shines on it, you know, mm -hmm. Um, that's about all, the all I worry about. I don't put a piece that I like in it that would get direct sunlight. But other than that, I have it up because I want to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And I, don't I, can, I can jump in on that too, unless somebody else wants to. But we've just had this discussion uh, and we were talking about archival sprays and coating it with, there's a Krylon spray. I'm not sure if you have uh, products in the store. Mm -hmm. um, I've purchased one, but I purchased it in the States because I couldn't find anything here. There's a yeah. Spectra. It's a Spectra of something anyway, yeah. but those kinds of sprays. But I think um, I, I'm more familiar with sort of the origami type papers and some of those are archival, but some of those aren't either. Mm -hmm. um, and my expectation is if I'm making and selling art, it better last for my lifetime at least, because after I'm dead, they'll have to come <laughs> after me. <laughs> well, I, it, when you asked that, I was thinking Momogami is a Japanese technique. And I, mm -hmm. I think about J Japanese techniques and ways of working. And I think, I don't think all their stuff seems to be last a long yeah. time so i don't so, know so so our they... experience with the momogami our experiences with japanese paper place and um what they recommend is the konyaku starch which is a starch not an oil and it mm. is it adds a lot of strength to the fabric and in fact um they used to do the uh, undergarments in paper coated with uh momogami or the, the konyaku starch 
for under the kimonos and often the undergarments would last longer than the kimono would. So uh -huh. uh, it can be really strong, but I don't think it was done with oils on a traditional uh, basis, at least not the ones that would last. Um, but yeah. yeah, I mean, we think of paper as being fragile, but washi papers, which are not tissues, they're long fibered mulberry, um, yeah. longer than flax, longer than, than linen. Um, and, you know, Japanese accountants, when the village would be under fire, they would roll up all their documents and chuck them down the well. Um, so your documents were safe while the village burnt down. They'd come back to rebuild it and they'd pull all the documents out of the well and dry them out. So washi papers and that are naturally strong. So, um, yeah, I just I want to have all the fun and the play, but I'm just particularly like fast, fastness and oil rotting substrates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Not that it's, but I mean, have fun. I mean, I do all sorts of crazy stuff. I can also say that just because you encapsulate it in plastic or in a spray, it's kind of like you put baloney in a plastic bag, it'll last a little bit longer, <laughs> but it's not going to last forever. Um, and I can vouch for that. So I did a whole, I did a little series. They were called little tea bags and it was washi paper with it, images drawn on them and stitched together. And I made little pillows. And the idea is the images on the pillows were you dreaming at night. And then the morning you could get up and make tea out of them and, and infuse your dreams. Right. So I made a whole bunch of these things and I'm like, Oh, it's just paper. It's sculpture. It's so delicate. I better coat them in acrylic. So I coated all the fronts of them in acrylic, thinking it would be easier to dust or be, be more durable. And here they are 22 years later, and the encapsulated fronts look terrible, and the untouched backs are in mint condition. condition. Yeah. So, yeah, natural materials is, is a good thing. <laughs> And so then that leads me to another comment. I'm going to roll up in the, this is Yvonne Bill and Wallace saying, Kim at the paint spot has a great selection of papers. And I have to attest to that because we're, we've been using paper in felting as well. And some of the cozy and the cozo, sorry, mm -hmm. cozo and mulberry papers work really well in felting too. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And just, uh, Okay, if, you, if you ever get a chance and you love Zoom sessions, Japanese Paper Place out of Toronto usually has a Washi Wednesday. Man, they do amazing things and uh, they're very experimental. So I highly recommend if you get on their mailing list. Um, oh, eye opening. So my, I've learned so much from them. Um, now, Karen, we kind of got sidetracked there. Do you want to continue with your samples? Because I think I've. Uh shown all oh i just i don't know if it's easy to see uh, i have them this is how i connected you you might be able to see the tool that's there and um, so you can see that i put it on the background and then stitched it down there but it's a fit it, it works but it's fiddly mm -hmm. and i think i've covered just about everything okay. um Oh, one you can, here's a piece. So if you just want to put some one thing on your artwork, so here this is a napkin that had a dragonfly on. It. So somewhere you might be able to want to put it onto your work piece. But what I had just shown you is collaging with paper. But uh, I'm moving now more to just having my paper as a highlighter. We'll see see where it goes. <laughs> Well, thanks very much. Anybody, any more questions for either of our presenters or for Kim? No. Um, another thing, Kim, do you carry wire form in the store? We don't. We have some fine wire for uh, sculpting, but I don't carry any mesh wire. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's what this is, though. It's for sculpting, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to look into it, but we haven't, haven't gotten too far down that, that rabbit hole. <laughs> 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 yeah. where do you stop where does art stop i don't know exactly don't know. Yeah. yeah okay any further questions speak now i can't I see all your hands i have a question Anne, you're muted. where's uh, Anne? and here there. um this question is for susan you had a piece with uh pan pastel on it and it was momogami 
And I wondered which went on first, the oil or the pan pastel? Well, I actually put the pan pastel on. Okay. The reason being is I, I wanted to, it was just a thought process. Oh, I've got this. This is where I was mixing my colors on this mm -hmm. paper. And then I thought, oh, and I thought, I wonder if I could momigami that. And I, and that's what I did. So gotcha. I, I de definitely, but I, I like the idea though, Kim, when you're talking about that, what, what's the name of the starch that the Japanese use? Oh, I'll write it in the comments. It's Koni, K-O-N-N-Y, Koni Yaku, Koni Yaku starch. And we carry it. It oh, is okay. um, a powder that you mix up and let sit overnight. Don't okay. mix up too much. And it's, yeah, same technique. You lay out your paper, slap it on the front, slap it on the back, massage it together. Um, you can keep the item in your fridge up to a week or so, but it rots very quickly. Um, you can tell when it's gone, it smells like cat pee. Oh, yeah, great. <laughs> it's real, real obvious, real <laughs> obvious. Dinner, <laughs> but, once it's, but once it's dried and cured, it's, it's fine. So cognac yeah, starch. Okay. Yeah, that's, I put it in the comments. Can we give another little tip for the Fiber Art Network conference coming up? Because we're going to have as one of our demo nights, um, Kim's going to bring a number of Japanese papers for us to try. Mm -hmm. And you'll have to purchase the paper because it's a little bit expensive. But we'll have the Kaniaku starch there. And Kim will be giving us a demo over a drink in the yeah. evening. Yes. So that'll be Saturday night, Kaniaku starch. Okay. Oh, were oh. we gonna were we gonna have like a collaborative like sculpture contest with like what do you do with this paper? Um, I don't know. Oh, well, we're that gonna make fun. it, and it'll be like, and mm -hmm. and now what? Yeah, so that'd be oh. fine. Well, because <laughs> no, there's drinks and wine involved, there's got to be some sort of collaborative <laughs> I, sculpture, I think mask making, or <laughs> something around the glass. You know. <laughs> Okay. little jackets little jackets for the wine glasses love it <laughs> kimonos and straight jackets yeah it, we're gonna go out good good oh <laughs> that's awesome more questions kim you're the only one who can see everybody at the moment i i because I'm uh, someone spotlighted, so I can't see the full screen. Okay, if you go, let's see, gallery here. Does that help? I switched my screen to gallery. So uh, I, I don't, I see everybody, but I don't see okay. anybody's hand or anybody yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, waving. Okay, and I'm looking for gallery. Here's the view. Gallery. There we go. Okay. Well, almost everybody's camera's off, so I can't see any hands anyway, so... <laughs> Speak now or forever hold your peace. Oh, I have a big tip, which we haven't even oh. shared yet. So as the sponsor, um, and with these ongoing courses, and now we're talking about things you can look up at the paint spot and find them, uh, make sure you use the coupon code. It's really hard to remember. F-A-N-2024 exclamation part or exclamation point. So it's FAN2024 exclamation point. We'll save you 20% at checkout. Awesome. That sounds great. So I have a last thing that I would just like to share if no one has any more comments. And I right, and Judy, wasn't Sue going to talk about her class? Oh, no. yes. Okay, Judy let's did. do that. Let's oh. do that first. Do you want to tell what your um, now I can't I have to close my screens here. Do you want to tell them what you're teaching, Sue? Sure. Um, well, I, I'm teaching a class called Paint, Dyes, and Inks, and it's showing different techniques on painting your fabrics for landscape. Then we then we go into using the um, dyes, and, and we're going to paint a floral with some dyes, with the dyes, and and I'm thickening it with something. We so I won't tell you what it is, but I, you know, it's it's something readily available, and then inks and how how I use my um, sharpies to to create textures on on fabric. So um, that's that portion. Uh, the next one is walled garden, and it's uh, building a, a garden. Um, I. I I packed it away, unfortunately, um, ready to go. But it's it's a 
it's a small piece, but it, we're going to work with textures and how to paint your backgrounds and how to do your stitching and how to build a, a three-dimensional wall feeling to the piece and, um, and bricks and mortar type of thing and then florals and trees on top of that. And then the third one is uh, my little mini scapes and it's for people who, who aren't, who'd like to have just fun playing with some fabrics and thread um, it's it's handwork and we work in a we work in a very small format and it's a relaxing day to sit and chat and and, and get inspired and thinking about your own stash and, and how you can use your own stash in the landscape so they're the three classes I'm teaching and you can register those through focus on fiber art association and the classes will be in Edmonton so Sue's coming to visit us we'll go for coffee Yes. <laughs> yes, perfect. Love to. Okay. Sounds good. Now Thank I'm you. just going to share my last little screen. Unless Kim, do you have anything else you would like to say? No, I'm great. Thank you. Okay. Well, it's telling me I'm sharing. Can you see this? Uh, this is not working for me. No. So share and then. Um, oh, yeah, there we go. Now there we go. Oh, yep. it just took the tenth click. That was not what <laughs> I was trying to share. <laughs> Okay. Well, thanks anyway. <laughs> yeah, 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 appreciate the plug. <laughs> oh, save changes? No. I, yes, no. Cancel. Don't save. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Let's try something different. And it's not there. Okay. I have a... I just... All right. I'm just going to say that... Am I back here? Can you see yeah, me now? Yeah, we can see you. Yep, you're here. Okay. All right. I'm just not going to do this. I had a thank you to um, Kim for hosting this tonight. A thank you to PBO Products. And I had contact information for Karen and for Susan. But I think almost everyone here is a member of Fiber Art Network. And you'll be able to reach them uh, off of the... Uh, membership list when you log into the website so you can contact and ask further questions after this um, as I said there's going to be a recording of this and I will send out a link and a password so that you'll be able to share it with whoever you would like to share it with and um, thank you again Kim and we will support you in any way we can with our purchases and with our promotions and with um, passing along the information that we've had on our own social websites our social account handles sorry i got to get my tech yeah. my technique information right um but anyway thank you all for coming really appreciate your time and see you soon yes thank, thank you, you so thank much thank you everyone thank you all so much it was lovely take care everyone yeah. okay bye-bye bye-bye thanks kim thank you